Hello and welcome to this channel. My name is Victoria and in this video we will talk about inflammatory heart diseases in children. Let's first recap the structures of the heart that can become inflamed. So the heart has an endometrium, the innermost layer, a myocardium, which is the muscular layer, and a pericardium, which is the outer layer. The heart also has different valves that can be affected as well. If the entire heart is affected, it is called pancarditis. Now we will look more into the different inflammations and what kind of organisms can cause it. First of all, we will talk about infective endocarditis. As the name suggests, it affects the endocardium, to be more specific, the valvular and or parietal myocardium. Usually a clot or thrombus called vegetation is formed, which damages the cardiac tissue and or devolves. It is relatively uncommon in children, but has a significant morbidity and mortality, so a rapid diagnosis and initiation of treatment are important. Endocarditis occurs more often in adults than children, but recent studies show that the numbers have lately been increasing due to longer survival of pediatric patients with chronic heart disease and of infants that are born long before term. So let's talk about the pathogenesis. Usually the endocardium is intact and so protected from microorganisms lodging to it and colonizing it. However, sometimes an injury to the endothelial surface occurs for example due to a hemodynamic or mechanical stress, which leads to the exposure of the underlying tissue and damage to the endothelium and the clot forms. This clot or vegetation is the area where microorganisms, whatever it might be, bind to and multiply. A thrombus consists usually of fibrin, leukocytes, platelets and bacteria. Chronic heart disease in children is a big risk factor for the development of endocarditis as the heart in these patients is more vulnerable and more prone to damages. Talking about bacteria, gram-positive bacteria as enterococci, staphylococci or streptococci are more likely to cause an endocarditis as they have the ability to attach to valvular surfaces and vegetations while gram-negative organisms don't have that ability. It is also possible that other pathogens, as fungi, cause an endocarditis. The colonization of different parts of the heart can bring long-term problems with it. Especially Staphylococcus is known to cause permanent valvular damage, as for example a perforation of the cusp of a valve or a rupture of the chordae tendinae. Also an embolization of the thrombus is possible, which can travel to either the pulmonary or systemic circulation, where it can cause an infarction, abscess or inflammation. In the next part I would like to talk about a clinical presentation. Children experience usually fever, weight loss, anemia and a murmur upon auscultation. Important to note is also that around 50% of patients with an infective endocarditis will also present with findings of an embolization so that a thrombus that was formed in the heart has been separated and traveled with the blood to another area in the body. The diagnosis is done by inflammatory markers in the blood. These can also show when the infection subsides. The diagnosis is usually confirmed by a blood culture. It is important to take at least 6 blood cultures in the first 12 to 24 hours in which the patient presents to the hospital. An echocardiograph can be used to help to confirm acute changes in the function of the valves, but it does not usually lead to the conclusion of a diagnosis. How do we treat those patients? After the blood cultures have been taken, we can initiate the empirical antibiotic treatment immediately. If the antibiogram deems it necessary, the antibiotic can be changed 
after the results of the blood culture and antibiogram are available. The antibiotics of choice are usually penicillin and nafcillin. The treatment usually occurs intravenously and is continued for six weeks after weeks another blood culture is taken to confirm that the bacteria were eradicated. In the next part I would like to talk about myocarditis. Myocarditis is usually a disease of the neonatal period and early infancy. It is rather rare later in childhood but can occur. It is the inflammation of the muscular layer of the heart and can be due to infectious pathogens, autoimmune diseases or it can be idiopathic. It usually has an abrupt onset with a sudden cardiovascular collapse and often leads to death within hours. Alternatively, it can lead to congestive heart failure, which may respond well to treatment. Usually the child presents with a weak peripheral pulse, the heart sounds sound muffled upon auscultation, and often a cardiomegaly is seen. Also sinus tachycardia and tachyarrhythmias are often seen. For the diagnosis we can use different instruments. We can make an ECG, which usually shows either a normal or reduced QRS voltage. Also ST segment depression and T wave inversion can be observed. In a chest x-ray we can see a cardiomegaly and pulmonary congestion. The echocardiogram often shows a dilated left atrium and left ventricle with a generally decreased contractility. How do we treat a patient with myocarditis? Some patients will go spontaneously back to a normal cardiac structure and function and do not require treatment or only some symptomatic therapy. In some patients the use of anticongestive heart failure drugs has been beneficial but often a chronic cardiomegaly is the result. Also corticosteroids and other immunosuppressive drugs have been used, especially in the case of an autoimmunitive cause of myocardial dysfunction. Intravenous gamma globulin can help in some cases with the inflammatory response. Despite all treatment, unfortunately many patients progress over months or years to a severe dysfunction of the heart muscle, which eventually leads to death. A heart transplantation is a way to help them then, but it unfortunately is connected to poor prognosis. The next kind of inflammation is pericarditis, so the inflammation of the outer layer of the heart. This can be due to many different causes, some of the most common are idiopathic, viral, purulent, bacterial, tuberculosis, juvenile rheumatoid arthritis, or systemic lupus erythematosus, uremia, neoplastic diseases, and after a surgery, so postoperatively. In a pericarditis, usually the pericardial sac as well as the visceral peritoneum are affected. Due to the inflammation, often fluid accumulates within the peritoneal sac, leading to a friction rub, and depending on the fluid amount, it can compress the heart and prevent it from expanding. Around 50% of patients experience pain. The pain can be very different in character and can range from dull pain over sharp pain to a stabbing pain. It can be felt in the left thorax or in the neck and shoulders and usually improves when sitting down and resting. The pericardial friction rub, which is due to the accumulation of fluid in the pericardium, can also be heard with a stethoscope, especially when the patient is sitting because then it usually becomes louder. When the fluid accumulates too fast or becomes too much, the heart can be restricted from expanding, leading to a cardiac tamponade. The patient usually becomes restless and shows signs of distress. The neck veins can be distended and the heart sounds can sound more quiet than usually. Also tachycardia can develop as the heart tries to beat faster to compensate for the lack of stroke volume due to the fluid. 
With the heart beating faster and the volume that is pumped out becoming lower, usually the peripheral pulses become weaker. The so-called pulsus paradoxus, so a decrease in the pulse pressure of more than 20 mm mercury with inspiration, is also a sign for cardiac tamponade. It is not exclusively for tamponade as it can occur in for example severe asthma as well, but it is an indicator. So how do we diagnose pericarditis? The anamnesis can be indicative if the patient suffers from systemic lupus erythematosus, a malignancy or uremia, but also if the patient had a recent infection with for example the virus Coxsackie virus B. A purulent pericarditis, so one where pus is formed, is often due to Haemophilus influenzae, Pneumococcus and Staphylococcus, so also the vaccine status should be checked. In the ECG, we can usually see in early stages of the disease an ST elevation and normally an upright T wave. Later on, the ST segment becomes isoelectric again and the T wave starts to become negative or inverted. The QRS voltage can be reduced, especially when large amounts of fluid accumulate in the pericardial sac. The chest X ray can be normal or fluid accumulations can be seen. In an echocardiography, a pericardial effusion can be recognized quite reliably and sometimes we can distinguish if the fluid is purulent as the leukocytes in the pus will give it a more cloudy or smoky appearance than fluid alone. The left ventricular diastolic diameter can be reduced when the ventricle cannot expand properly due to the fluid accumulation. In the case of a cardiac tamponade, we may also see that the caval vein may be distended and in some cases we can see a collapse of the right atrium and right ventricle. The treatment consists of invasive and pharmacological agents. Symptomatic relief is usually achieved by pain medication. It is important to note the digoxin and diuretics are contraindicated to give as they slow down the heart rate and reduce the filling pressure, so they prevent the heart from compensating for the cardiac tamponade. If the pericarditis is of purulent nature, we can give high doses of empirical antibiotics. In some cases a pericardiosynthesis is done. This is the extraction of some of the fluid that accumulates in the pericardium by help of a needle. This fluid can be then examined for the cause of the pericarditis. So to check if a micronoid organism and which one is contained in the fluid. It is also done as an emergency procedure to treat the tamponade as the heart will be able to expand more adequately without the fluid restricting its expansion. Also in some cases when a cardiac tamponade occurs recurrently a pericardial window can be made. This is a surgery where a part of the pericardium is removed so that the fluid won't be able to accumulate again. If a pericardial window is not sufficient, it might be considered to perform a pericardiectomy, so a surgery where a larger part of the pericardium is removed to avoid the formation of a restrictive pericarditis in which the pericardial sac forms scars and becomes too tight for the heart to expand. This is usually done in the cases of a purulent pericarditis. That's it for this video, I hope it was helpful and if you like our channel please subscribe, comment and like. Thank you for watching and hopefully see you in the next video.